So one of my questions about building a successful limb angiography practice is people shy away from it. Is there any kind of buy-in that has to happen from your partners? Is it a good idea for like a, a junior level academic person or someone who's like starting out in a private practice? Like, hey, let me try and build this. Like, have there been any like system roadblocks that you've had to overcome to like build this type of practice? Because like it does require like some special, I don't know what I would call it, facility management. But it's a little bit nuanced in the terms of like the resources that you need. You know, I think you bring up a really good point. Historically, some of the roadblocks were having the the particular pumps to do the injections and things like that. That really isn't a roadblock anymore. I mean, my typical kit is a 25-gauge, 9-centimeter needle, a three-way that holds up to the contrast media for lymphangiograms, some tubing, and some polycarbonate syringes. That's it. You don't use, you don't hook them up to the... Um... Balloon insufflators? No, you know, I, I actually like doing the hand injection and controlling it. And I like actually being in the room and watching because what I do is I take spot radiographs at different time points to kind of really monitor it myself. And sometimes I like watching it with um, fluoroscopy just to see what the pattern of flow looks like. And and the reason I do that particularly early, for example, like in a lymphocele, I want to see that lymph node that I'm injecting through how it communicates with the lymphocele, how close it is how many branches are going to that and what the, you know, where's the early flow versus the late flow? How, if I vary how I inject what's happening. So I like to actually be there and and doing it rather than just letting the insufflator do it. The actual inventory, you know, compared to like spyglass, for instance, right? Yeah. Some places will say, Hey, you know, uh, this doesn't, yeah, this is really expensive. You know, we need the tower, we need this, that, the other. You really have all the material here. And all you're doing is an exam that already has CPT codes. And if you combine it with an embolization, you know, now you've actually offered a therapy to a patient that's that's dramatically, A, beneficial for them, and B, beneficial for your practice and your internal relationships with other providers in the hospital system that you work at. Bill, can you just, while I'm thinking about it, can you just drop us the name of the three-way that you use, the stopcock? That's a really good question because I used to use one that was made by Cook and it was like this opaque uh, white plastic three-way. I don't believe Cook makes it anymore. So now um, I use a four-way, but I don't remember the actual manufacturer, but we actually went through and tested multiple things and we found that this is the one that actually works the best. Um, but off the top of my head, I don't remember, but I can uh, email that to you. I'll, sure. I'll get with you offline and I'll make sure that we post that. I, for some reason, like I can't tell you how many times like... You know, anytime you're you're dealing with kind of a caustic agent, everyone's looking for that special three way, and then some places just don't do it that frequently. And you're like, you're calling like your main facility, and you're like, what's the three what's the three way that we use? And and then you're everyone's trying to scramble to like figure it out. You know, it's just a small piece of the puzzle, but it's it's a piece. But metal um, three ways always work too, by the way. And a yeah, lot of yeah, places absolutely. Will have metal three ways. Absolutely, so. absolutely. Um, you're right. If you can get a hands on a, a reliable metal three way supply, then you're good to go. All right, so. Hand injections, what kind of sedation do you use with yours typically? Moderate sedation. If we're just doing a simple lymphangiogram, really local. almost nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just, just local patients don't even have to be NPO. That, you know, they can eat, they can drink, whatever. I tell them, hey, we're just doing a diagnostic exam plus minus CT or MR, depending on you know what we're thinking for that. Um, in some cases, I just do cone beam in the room if, if the CT or the MR is occupied. And you get a fairly high quality study. I mean, the, the rapidity with which we can do cone beam at multiple stations now, it makes things very easy. Sure. I agree with that. How long does the procedure take you? Well, I guess it depends on what procedure we're talking about. How about just a diagnostic, like from, from groin injection to seeing the thoracic duct? Yeah, so I would say from groin injection to seeing the thoracic duct. And, and let's say the caveat of also having the patient in sequential compression devices. Okay. All right. That's a good tip. That speeds things up as well. I'd say if you do that, I would say 30 minutes. Very nice. If you don't mind me asking, at what temperature do you keep um, the dye? Just room temperature. Okay. I hear some people try and warm it up ahead of time. I don't know if that makes a big difference. Just keep it at room temp. Oh, I don't know if it makes a difference. I've never done it, but uh, you know, I've always just left it at room temperature. 